The Ontario government recently unveiled some major changes to the way health care will be delivered in this province. Stakeholder groups have responded pretty much as expected. But what hasn't been expected is a public disagreement by two people whom tradition holds tend to keep their advice private. Not this time. Both Dr. Bob Bell and Michael Dechter are former deputy ministers of health for the province of Ontario, and they see the new restructuring very differently. So we thought we'd invite them here to find out why. And here are former orthopedic surgeon Dr. Bob Bell and Michael Dechter, who's currently a member of the Premier's Council on Improving Health Care and Ending Hallway Medicine. Deputies, good to have you here, or former deputies, I guess I should say. Why don't we just off the top here, give me 45 seconds or so to outline uh, what the new changes are are intended to do and to be, and then we'll pick up on some of your comments after that. Mm -hmm. Sheldon, if you would, the graphics. Uh, here we go. The government has just unveiled a new provincial organization called Ontario Health that's going to consolidate 20 health care agencies that currently exist all under one roof. That's like Cancer Care Ontario and eHealth, etc., all under one roof. They're also going to create Ontario Health Teams, comprised of health care providers, that's hospitals, doctors, home care organizations, and so on, that will function, as the government says, as one seamless caregiving team. The government expects to have 30 to 50 of these health teams responsible for 300,000 patients in place over the next three years. The Ontario health teams are also expected to use digital technology so patients can have access to their records and the system will be able to follow the patient journey, again this word, seamlessly. Patients might also in future be able to book their appointments online. And there is a new commitment to virtual care. So you may not have to physically visit your doctor to receive care. You might be assessed, for example, by a video interface where appropriate. And the government insists that any savings realized from this more efficient administration of the healthcare system will be invested back into the system. Let's start with this. Can I get each of you to give me your sort of overarching, for lack of a better expression, elevator pitch summation of what you think this does, positively or negatively. Dr. Bell, start us off. Thanks, Steve. Um, well, this is gonna happen. So no point in saying it's the wrong thing to do. And let's face it, our health system is flexible. The providers in our health system are the world's best. It will succeed no matter what the organization. However, I think the opportunity to move Ontario Health forward very much depends on the implementation of this plan. Devil's in the details. Devil's in the details, and I think there are certain problems that are starting right from the beginning, a level of perhaps deviousness around how this is going to begin. The council that uh, the Michael sits on provides great service to produced his first report and said it was then gonna produce a second report with options for consultation we then discovered at the same time as this report was being written, legislation was being prepared that had the fully baked plan. And if implementation is gonna be successful, there has to be a sense of trust. There's also a sense that this is somewhat vindictive. We just learned last week that our Lynn boards were terminated. Their orders in council were finished. They were told by email that their service was finished. Those this is the local health integration The network. local health integration boards that had worked very hard over the last few years to try to bring a local context to the Ontario health system. Mm -hmm. They were ready to brief the new Ontario health board. They knew they were gonna be finishing their service. They wanted to have contact to talk about what the problems were in Thunder Bay and Waterloo, Wellington, and suddenly they were dismissed. It felt vindictive. Hmm. So okay, I hold, think, hold off there, that's a good start. Thank you. Um, Mr. Decker, I'm not accustomed to hearing deputy ministers use expressions like devious and vindictive yep. in describing provincial government plans. What say yep. you? Well, neither am I. And, and I frankly find that the rhetoric uh, is inappropriate. I, you know, we're, we both served as public servants. Uh, I served a long time ago. I've worked for, I think, every government since I served as deputy minister of health. And that's not vocabulary I would choose. So, uh, you know, I have a bit of a problem because I, you know, I can't tell whether Dr. Bell is, you know, a former public servant or whether he's taken on an advocacy role or a political role. But let me leave that aside and come back to the basic question here, which is, is it a good idea to have this agency? And, and here I should say, 
I can't speak as a member of the Premier's Council. Only Dr. Devlin speaks on behalf of the Council. We did one report which pointed out some very significant problems in the system. They're problems that have been there. They're not unknown to anybody. Uh, hallway medicine has been a recurring issue. Uh, it's real. 1,200 people probably last night spent their night on a gurney in an emergency room or a hallway in, in Ontario. Uh, handoffs have been troubled in the system between hospital and home, between home and hospital. So people get stuck. They don't get the care they need. Um, but I, I want to say that the Ontario Health, uh, one of the most encouraging things I've heard is that the first agency that's going to be integrated is going to be Cancer Care Ontario. Because I think Cancer Care Ontario actually has the DNA that could make this thing really succeed. Um, and, and I'll give Dr. Bell credit because he, he, you know, it was on his watch that Cancer Care Ontario expanded beyond cancer. So it, it's been very effective with cancer, but it took on renal. And, you know, we, we get very good marks nationally um, on cancer care being organized. We get terrible marks on diabetes, for example. Like we rank probably one or two on cancer with BC. We're both pretty good, but when you get to diabetes, we're way down the list. So the learning from Cancer Care Ontario, if that becomes the DNA, of Ontario Health, there's a the hope is that this will make the whole system better, rather than making cancer care worse, which which is a legitimate fear to have. Okay, let's pluck apart now. We're going to dive a little deeper on some of these things you brought up, but I should give you an opportunity first of all to comment on his suggestion that you've moved from advisor to advocate to quasi politician here. I mean, the word he used was political in the comments that you're making these days? You know, Michael is absolutely wrong. I am not political. I am simply a health care guy. I spent four years as a deputy minister, but I've spent 44 years working in the Ontario health system. I care about this transformation deeply. This is the biggest change to health care that's occurred in the last 50 years. If it's going to work, it has to be done right. The implementation has to be appropriate. There has to be trust that what we're hearing is what's going to happen. Why I say devious is because I don't think that's what's happened to this point. There's an opportunity to correct that, to make it more open and transparent, and I'm encouraging the government through my con conversation to actually do that. How, how could it be more transparent than it is right now? Well, you know, for example, um, Michael's talked about Cancer Care Ontario taking a leadership role. I think that's crucial. I think we need to have a strong cancer care leader that actually has an element of Ontario Health that's independently led, focused on cancer, focused on renal, that we don't see a decapitation of Cancer Care Ontario. We've heard the Premier say that a number of leaders of the local health integration networks and the other agencies involved in this integration are going to be fired. That's not the way to start leadership of Cancer Care Ontario bringing Ontario Health along through an implementation that makes use of Cancer Care Ontario's experience. You got a point here? Well, I mean, there's, there are 20 crown corporations that are being merged into this agency. Um, they're not going to need 20 vice presidents of finance. They're not going to need 20 heads of IT. Um, and, you know, I think the Premier's uh, suggestion that people wouldn't lose their jobs was not frankly extended to the executive level. It never has been. You know, people serve in high paying big jobs, you know, with the risk that if things get reorganized, whether hospitals get merged, jobs disappear. But the whole push, um, and it, it begins before this government, and it begins in communities, has been to get more money for the front line, to get more money for the actual delivery of care. And that's what this is about. And, and this is this is okay. one of the, the pushes. And look, um, it, it took a long time for all these organizations to get set up. And I think everyone, when it was set up, had a, a purpose. And But I don't think anyone would have said, let's create all of these things separately with their own infrastructure, with their own management team. I mean, it's a lot of executives. Let me follow up on that because, because one of the criticisms I've heard is that if you have a Cancer Care Ontario, let's say you're watching this right now and, and you're dealing with cancer. Yeah. 
Under Cancer Care Ontario, as a standalone organization, the argument goes, it was able to focus more laser-like on whatever issues you were dealing with, whereas as one organization out of 20 in a bigger super agency, it may have more difficulty doing that. That's the suggestion. Well, let me push back very hard on that because, you know, Cancer Care Ontario, which divested its actual delivery of care and became a, became a standards and, and a, a leadership organization in terms of, of, of the quality of care and, and innovation, all of that was really important. But you can't have a high-quality cancer system inside of a not high-quality healthcare system. And, and the dilemma is, people don't get up in the morning and say, I've got cancer, let me go to the cancer system. The only way they get there is through the rest of the system. And if, if you've got very slow referrals, if you've got long wait times for diagnosis, if you've got people parked in emergency rooms for hours and hours who get discouraged and go away, then you're not getting to the cancer system. He seems and, to be saying your health care system is not as good as you think it is. Well, it certainly it's not my health care system. Well, you were responsible means. for it for a I while. I was. Yeah. However, you don't improve the health care system by reducing the leadership and the focus on cancer care within those parts of the system that are dealing with cancer. You want to take the elements of the yeah. cancer system. I think you're talking about, Michael, the integration, mm -hmm. the focus on quality, what cancer care is known for, and spread those characteristics across the rest of the system. Yes. I utterly agree. But you don't do that. And I'm going to come back to the implementation. You don't do that by not talking to the chair of Cancer Care Ontario during the course of development of this plan, by not talking to the CEO, not getting advice of the experts who've developed the cancer system, and then simply eliminating the board. We need to take those characteristics and spread them broader, no question. Well, I spent a, a very interesting hour with the CEO of Cancer Care Ontario, Michael Shearer, two or three weeks ago. He felt that he was actually being consulted and involved in the change. I, I think the board decision, I, I don't know how you deal with that. I don't know how you deal with 20 boards that are going. Um, you know, in a, I don't know that that's ever been something governments have been very good at. Mm -hmm. When governments change things, they do it by legislation. Once they're, and legislation has dates in it, and there has to be continuity. Sure. And can we just do a know. bottom line example here? Let, let's just take let, let's take a bottom line example of somebody who's in hospital, has a procedure done, needs follow up care at home, mm -hmm. goes home has to somehow connect with a home care agency in order to have that follow-up care. From what we have heard from many critics, Dr. Bell, that patient, that patient journey has not been as seamless as it should be. And that trying to get that follow-up care at home, trying to make it all work, is too difficult and not seamless. Is that an accurate criticism? You know, I think the home care system for post-discharge patients needs to improve. There's no question. I think it has improved. The integrated coordinated care that was brought into our system by St. Joseph's Hospital three or four weeks, or three or four years ago, now been spread to Trillium, to North York General, and other places where the care coordination in the hospital certainly begins long before the patient's discharged. In fact, perhaps before the patient's even admitted to the hospital where there's one number to call after discharge, we know how to do it better. We need to scale that, we need to spread that. We can do better, there's no question. But making that happen, for example, within patients who are in, not hospital, but in community, who don't have the connection to hospital, that's a tougher challenge. And that's something where our care, co care coordination staff in the LINS have experience with identifying patients in the community, that needs to be transferred to the new organizational structure. That's a critical part of the success of Ontario Health, is to understand how community home care will develop. And right now, it's hard to see where those formerly Lynn government resources are actually going to be organized within Ontario right. Health. That example that I just gave, are they likely to do better under the former system or the newer system? Well, time will tell, as it always does with these things. I think the hope is, and the hope that many of us have had for a very long time, is we'll actually get the integrated health delivery organizations. There have been a few kind of um, attempts or efforts or things that are a little more integrated. There are certainly parts of the province 
where it would be easier to do. You look at a Hamilton and you've got St. Joe's, you've got a very big family health team with well over 100 doctors. So there are fewer pieces to put together. But what's worked elsewhere in the world, UK, US, the leading health systems, you're, you're not a patient of a hospital and then a patient of a home care organization and then a patient of a rehab facility. You're a patient of, of one organization. And so they own your care all the way through. And, you know, we've, we've made some efforts, but you still, in a lot of the province, have patients who have a discharge plan done by the discharge planner in the hospital. Then they're discharged. Then they have to have an assessment by the CCAC, which can take time to arrange. Community Care Access Community Center. Community Care Access Center, now tucked under the LIN, but mm -hmm. still a function. Um, and then, uh, if they're not going, if they're going home, then there's a huge fight over how many hours they're getting. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the number is often two hours. That seems to be kind of the, the kind of what you're going to get unless you've got some really heavier needs. Mm -hmm. But that process is adversarial. The family, the patient, fight with it. The, the word I always hear is we've been fighting with the CCAC to get care because they don't have enough money to pay for the care that people want. Now, do they have enough money to pay for the care that people need? Maybe, maybe not. That's hard to tell. I saw his eyebrows uh, go up when you said and, they and have to fight for care, but yeah, that is but what you hear. That's, well, that's yeah. the phrase I always hear. The hope would be, and, and then if they're going into another institution, like a rehab center, there's a third assessment because the receiving institution has to assess. The hope would be you've got an integrated uh, team, the Ontario Health Team, responsible for 300,000 people, that when someone moves from one part of that entity to another, mm -hmm. that there would be one plan for their care rather than two or three assessments. Okay, Dr. Bell, come back. So, you know, there's a, there's a bit of magic thinking in that, I think, Michael, in that we currently have a LIN system where care is organized around your postal code. And we have care coordinators who work for the LIN who are responsible for patients living in those areas. We're now gonna stop that system and we're gonna to move to a new system with 30 to 50 Ontario health teams yet to be developed, yet to be identified. I think that this concept that we're gonna have a developmental plan with 30 to 50 proposals coming forward that is going to suddenly integrate care not around where the patient lives, but around where the providers are. That's worrisome. No, I, I don't see it that way at all. And, and it's, it isn't all clear yet. It's but not. The, the, as I understand it, the ministry will be receiving the, and approving the first five uh, of these organizations this summer. So they've set out what needs to be, in, they won't approve one unless it's got, and I think their list of six or seven possible, possible services. Mm -hmm. So clearly primary care, acute care, rehabilitation, uh, uh, mental health services. So, so they're looking for uh, people to come forward, bottom up, and say, hey, in Hamilton, we can put these pieces together. And what's your concern? But, you know, we'll here's my concern. My concern is innovation usually occurs on a basis of stability. Look at the impact of that innovation and scale it further. What we're saying is the LINs are gone. We've said the boards of the LINs are gone. The Premier said that the executives for the LINs are not going to have their jobs any longer. That base of stability that innovation occurs on, I'm worried about that, Michael. We have 800,000 frail Ontarians who every year receive home care in the community. I'm worried about the stability of their care while we innovate. The innovation is good, don't get no, me wrong. But could you speak to his point about people feel they need to fight to get whatever access to resources it, they need. It's a that's, bureaucracy. That's Mr. But what that, what that is is a top-down bureaucracy. The LINs, scarcely. the CCACs. It's not bottom-up. Okay. I want you it to would have been bottom bottom up. Up. It would have been bottom-up if the original vision of the government, which Minister Smitherman brought in, had been adhered to. But it wasn't. They were changed to be arms of the government with their, their people appointed by the government. And when that happened they became a top-down resource manager. And of course people fight with them because they ration care. Okay. Well, so the care coordinators who work in the community to assess needs in home care 
have a great deal of difficulty satisfying patients and families they can provide enough. But of course, their resources are limited. Yes. We have 42% of our provincial dollars being spent on health care. There's a limit to how much home care can be provided. It's the job of the care coordinators, not on a top-down basis, people who are nurses, social workers in the community who assess the needs the patients have to maintain safe, productive life in the community. People aren't always happy. But that needs to be stable while we look at new ways to do things. Okay, and the Ontario Health Teams are indeed a new way of doing Let me things. jump in here because I don't want to run out of time before we get to hear from the Minister of Health, who was in this one of those two chairs uh, not too long ago. And the question I had for her was, this new super agency that's now going to be in charge of everything, Ontario Health, whoever heads that thing, and we know who it is now, is going to be a major player in health care in this province. And I wanted to know from the Minister of Health whether or not it was going to be kind of a friend of the Premier's or a former defeated Tory candidate taking that job, or whether it would be somebody of merit and substance. And here's what she had to say about that. Sheldon, the clip, please. We are assuring the people of Ontario that the people who will be sitting on this agency will be people who have the knowledge and the expertise to make sure that this job is done properly. You make the board appointments, I presume, right? Uh, ultimately, I sign off on them, but I can tell you I have not been involved personally in the interviews because I think it is really important that this be done with the assistance of the outside provider and that the candidates are chosen based on their merit. So there's a commitment that this is not going to be a sort of typical political appointment. Bill had an act as the chair. Yes. And the chair members are excellent people. Yeah. So Very encouraging. You're okay with all of them? I absolutely am. And are you okay with, with the process being undertaken for who the new CEO is going to be, a very big player? Um, you know, you, you want to sort of see who comes up. There, mm -hmm. there, there are, uh, you know, a significant number of, of people who would do a terrific job at that yeah. in, in this province. And, you know, I, we all have our short lists. Uh, yes. And uh, we'll all be, I think, uh, pleased when that appointment's made and it reduces the uncertainty. You know, and, and, and to be fair, Bob, I think some of your early comments on all of this, because the legislation was leaked, it created an atmosphere where people knew a big change was coming, but they didn't know who the characters would be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was fear. There was concern. I think the Premier's Council, when Dr. Devlin asked me to sit on it, I said, is this an expert panel or is this going to be more of a political thing? And he said, no expert panel, and that's what it is. It's, it's people who would, you know, who've worked for a number of different governments. And I think the board is, you know, the appointments that have been made so far are very strong, people with both governance experience and, you know, maybe a little less health experience than some other you boards. Know, the thing but, that worries me the most, Michael, is this is the biggest change, I think you'd agree, that's happened to Ontario Health since Medicare was introduced to Ontario yes. 50 years. And what really concerns me is the change management. This is an enormous system, a $60 billion plus system. How do you actually have people providing integrated care, changing the resource distribution and allocation through the system when there's no strong change management plan? There's no leader, there's no CEO appointed as of yet. We're talking about firing people before we've talked about appointing the leader to the system. You need to change the direction that people are going across this province over the next three to four years. There's no strong case yet as to how that's happening. And we're already several months into it. Change occurs with a strong program. This is how things are gonna happen, well, with organized anticipation of how change will occur. Yeah, I, 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 I guess I'm gonna disagree here because one, the legislation's been introduced, but it hasn't been passed. So there is a real problem with acting on a law that, that, the that board's hasn't been, been appointed. Passed. Yeah. The board has been appointed. Mm, um, hasn't been passed. And, uh, you know, I, I hear lots of integration uh, and conversations. Uh, the deputy is playing a leading role in this. Alan Angus person. is yeah. someone we both uh, work with and for. have great respect. Um, and I have great confidence that, that they will get there on, on the transition. They are keeping the heads of the agencies in place on an interim basis extending them so that there's stability. And I, I believe that this will emerge and emerge reasonably quickly. But there is some urgency to this. Look, if Ontario were sitting with a balanced budget and a health system that everybody was happy with and, and people were getting the service they need, I would say take, take a longer period of time. But 
we are borrowing 15, 14, 15 billion dollars a year in financial markets to pay for expenditures that revenues aren't supporting. 40% of that's for health. So when you say to people, do you want us to borrow another six billion dollars and pour it into the health system? We're, we're not we suggesting that. What well, I'm suggesting is that the plan needs to be a plan that's consistent. Yeah. You don't bring a report out in January and say we're going to have opportunities for consultation around uh, various options, and then at the same time have it discovered that the legislation is already developed. Okay. Let's try but, one more thing here. Time permits one more conversation, no. uh, one more area of discussion, and that is the government has promised that whatever people lose their jobs, you talked about the 20 VPs and the 20 IT people and so on, now merged into one agency, you don't need that many. How confident are both of you that that money saved from those jobs that are no longer needed will actually go back into frontline patient care? Dr. Bell. Well, first of all, there's not a huge amount of money spent in administration in the Ontario health system. That's simply a fact. Every penny should go back into health care delivery. Unfortunately, when you look at the history of change, when you look at the severance costs, when you look at the costs of the consultants that actually come and advise on this, quite often you don't see this happen. I think that we're going to hold the government to task to make sure that happens. There are lots of metrics that we can measure to see how many home care hours that are being accomplished, how many primary care physicians are being hired, how many new primary care groups are being formed in the province. I think we're all going to be holding the government to task on that, and I'm encouraged that we will see increased resources. But, you know, um, change is hard, and we really need a strong change plan to be evident to the public and to be evident to the people working in health care. How is this going to occur? The biggest change in Ontario health care. What's the plan to make it happen? Last word to Michael Decker. Well, I, I think it is a big change. I think that it's overdue. Um, and I think we do have to be vigilant. Uh, for example, the, the provincial government signed on with the federal government to receive money under the new accord. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of that money is targeted for mental health, which has been, is an area of enormous need. If I had to say mm -hmm. cancer care is really you yeah. know, well organized, Agreed. what's the area that isn't? It's been mental health for a long time. I wanna be sure that when that money flows to Ontario, that it flows through to mental health. And that's going to be a big question because there are parts of the system that, that do work pretty well. Emergency care. You go to an emergency, you may wait longer than you'd like to, or you, you know, because there are people who probably shouldn't be there, but you know, the care you get is high quality. But if you're mentally ill and you go, you're often sent off, maybe with a, a prescription, maybe not, but you can wait six months to see, a, and, and that's wrong. And every other system that's fixed that problem has made it easy to get from, you know, from the diagnosis to some kind of, of care quickly. So, uh, you know, I'll be looking very closely at all of it. As, we as both will, will we be. Both Mental will. illness but, care is a criteria. Yeah, that, that one is, it, it, not, it's crucial. My, my hunch is we should reconvene this gathering in a year or two and see the changes that have Six come. Six months, I'd say. <laughs> Six months is all it'll take? All right. We'll, <laughs> any, anytime <laughs> you're willing to have us back, I'd be pleased to do it. That was uh, uh, an unusually civilized discussion, I got to mm -hmm. say, between two people who have very differing views on this thing. Uh, Dr. Bob Bell, Michael Dector, former Deputy Ministers of Health for the province of Ontario, thanks so much for making time for us here at TV Thank tonight. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.